Hey everyone, it's Peter, and uh, I'm going to talk in this lecture a little bit about an art movement known as Rococo. Um, Rococo is a kind of interesting um, art style, an art movement, uh, particularly to modernize, because it looks like it uh, has sort of given up on the idea that art has to have serious meaning or be at the behest of um, you know, powerful and influential, say, religious organizations or political organizations, as we so typically think of, uh, you know, in relationship to the earlier uh, period, typically known as Baroque. Um, a great place to think about Rococo, uh, to begin the uh, exploration of the topic, is to consider the radical changes that began to emerge uh, following the death of Louis XIV in 1715. If we think about uh, the French Baroque, and especially if we think about it in terms of its, um, you know, kind of orbiting around uh, the person and the aura and the, you know, the authority of Louis XIV, we especially think about the palace at Versailles outside of Paris. If we study the kinds of sources uh, that are writing about court life uh, in France and, uh, and in Versailles, say from 1700 or so into 1715, um, it's pretty clear that the good old days are over as far as, um, as, far as Versailles uh, is concerned. And indeed, if we take the sort of longer view of the 18th century in France, the impression is one of increased uh, precariousness, especially regarding state finances, and the kinds of pressures that are going to be put on the French uh, nation, uh, thanks, among other things, to a, a really backward and, and inefficient system of taxation, and, and really much more, especially Louis XIV's proclivity for waging war, um, it's, it's pretty easy to see why people uh, were less and less uh, interested uh, in staying in the vicinity of Versailles any, any longer. Upon his death, um, the court basically rapidly uh, left Versailles. Versailles can be thought of in many ways as a very effective kind of surveillance uh, location, a place that is really designed to keep courtiers in their place, keep the aristocracy uh, in its place, um, and, and kind of under the watchful eye of the king. In Paris, that's next to impossible to do. And um, the idea of, you know, reasonably powerful and wealthy people saying, okay, enough, enough of being under the thumb of the king. Let's have our own place in Paris where we can meet without, you know, in essence, being spied upon or supervised or, you know, controlled. So what happens is... Um, a wave of development occurs in Paris, where basically wealthy people uh, seek out apartments, basically kind of like very expensive luxury condominiums in, in New York City uh, today. And it's pretty obvious from the very beginning that the a kind of decorative mode that's typical of, of Versailles is just not going to be appropriate for the much smaller scale, more more personal and more personable um, uh, locations of, of hotels in um, uh, in Paris. So this is a, a partic particularly good one, the one that we're looking at right now, a good example uh, uh, from an architect. And oftentimes Rococo productions uh, like this, the, you know, multiple uh, individuals uh, contributing to them. In this particular case, Germain Beaufran. Um, along with help uh, from painters and sculptures, Netoire and Le Moyne. Um, the date on this is uh, 1737 to 1740, so right in the kind of heyday of French Rococo get coming to the middle of the 18th century. And, and if we think about it in contrast to the sheer bombast and almost oppressive opulence of uh, something like, for instance, the the Hall of Mirrors, the Galerie des Glaces um, of Versailles, some significant differences begin to emerge right away. One, of course, is a much smaller scale. Another is uh, the lack of geometric regularity 
in uh, the decorative motifs. So there's a, a very kind of um, extreme, I would say, extremely organic and um, uncontrolled, um, really lively and almost capricious um, linearity in, um, in French Rococo that's, that's expressed here. Uh, a lack of sense of weight or stability or solidity, gravitas in the political or religious sense is, is pretty much absent. The palette in Rococo, whether it's architecture or, or painting, tends to be lighter in its, um, uh, in, in its uh, key, that is say, it tends more toward pink rather than red or scarlet, pale blues, pinks, greens, and so forth uh, dominate. So it's, this, is, I think, is a, an important theme to keep in mind, the sense of a private uh, dwelling uh, decorated according to the owner's taste, not according to the sort of abstract political principles that the, that the King of France embodied. Um, such uh, places uh, required uh, decoration, of course. Uh, the artists that we're looking at uh, right now, or the, the work of the artist and the artist uh, that we're looking at, was not one uh, a person inclined to produce purely decorative art. Um, a number of other artists, some of them pretty forgettable, supplied that need in abundance. Um, Antoine Watteau, uh, however, did produce the kinds of paintings that one would expect to fit in in a place like uh, the Salon de la Princesse. Antoine Watteau, 1684 to 1721, so you can see by those dates, he uh, lives a relatively short life, uh, dying at the age of uh, 37, probably of tuberculosis. Now, Watteau uh, is really quite striking for a number of reasons. One of the most important ways in which he's uh, contributing really to the history of art in France in particular, but also in a European sense, is the degree to which he worked against the sort of Poussin consensus, the classicism and the rigor and the rationality. And we can see that at work in this very small uh, panel painting uh, in English, who would be the, the indifferent one, the one who doesn't particularly care uh, one way uh, or the other. Uh, the other. It's a, a portrait of a young man, and possibly uh, a character. I do like to represent um, characters from a, a type of drama, a comedic drama, um, the so-called Commedia dell'arte, uh, uh, a sort of form that's imported from Italy, as the Italian of the, of the word or phrase, I should say, indicates, where stock characters would typically put themselves in um, positions having to do with, you know, the sort of dilemmas of love, not typically ever particularly tragic, um, but oftentimes with a kind of sense of ephemerality. And, and uh, yeah, it's a, this, this character really illustrates that very nicely. There might be interludes, musical interludes or dancing interludes, where grace and elegance and uh, you know, a certain distance, a remove from the serious affairs of life is, is present. So this young individual, uh, young man, is in a very graceful uh, kind of ballet stance, um, set against this very gauzy and ephemeral landscape that very clearly, and we, we have ample evidence to show this very clearly derived from the likes of Titian, etc. cetera. Uh, paintings by Titian and Giorgione and Bellini are, um, you know, in the, in the collection of uh, collections, I should say, of aristocrats and the French king. So Watteau had access to this kind of material and also engravings and drawings. Um, so his indifferent one is a, is a great kind of counterpoint and probably not coincidentally a critique of the famous Rigaud uh, portrait of Louis XIV, which basically has a very similar stance um, to the indifferent young man. Um, but obviously is attempting to um, induce in the viewer a kind of aura of political power, which, the, again, the figure on the left could not possibly care less about. Watteau's great uh, masterpiece in many ways uh, is his pilgrimage to uh, Scythera. And Scythera is uh, the island that legend had, mythology had, associated with uh, the goddess Venus. So it's the kind of island of love. And again, that 
important contribution of Watteau uh, was to work against the Poussin dog, dogma, really, especially in the French Academy of Classicism, by submitting this um, as a kind of um, uh, evidence, in essence, that he uh, belonged in, in the Royal Academy. And this didn't really fit the categories of art, such as history painting, et cetera, et cetera, that a serious artist was supposed to be part of. And, and so what he wound up doing was being kind of admitted with a, with a new category. Um, this is called Fet Galant, F-E-T-E-G-A-L-A-N-T-E, -E -E. basically pictures of, of, you know, attractive young men and women uh, engaged in kind of this polite, genteel, merrymaking, celebrating, um, just having a, having a nice time in a landscape like this. However, like much of Watteau's work, the painting is suffused with an eerie melancholy and, and a slight, uh, again, sadness tinges this. People have been tempted to think about that in regard to the artist's own struggle with uh, a lingering illness. And I think that the jury will never ultimately come to a conclusion on that. But um, it certainly points out, indeed, this was a controversy in the 17th into the 18th century, that there were multiple ways of creating expressive uh, paintings. And Watteau provided in that um, uh, dispute between especially the adherents of Poussin versus those of Rubens, um, that a, a, in essence, a native French uh, alternative could be fine be found uh, against uh, Poussin. Um, there are many, many uh, other artists and, and paintings, especially, and sculpture too, that we could explore in regard to uh, the development of the Rococo. Um, probably the most famous in many ways, and, and otherwise the most notorious, is Fragonard. Now, Fragonard, uh, in this very well-known piece called The Swing, presents a, a much more explicitly erotic and sensual vision of the Rococo that Watteau never really, uh, I think, develops to any great extent in his work, certainly not in comparison with the, uh, with the work of Fragonard. Um, in the swing, you have basically a young man on the left who is admiring the view uh, up the skirt of uh, presumably his lover who's being swung, and swinging was a, well known as a symbol, a euphemism for sexual activity. The swing is being propelled by an elderly man uh, off on the right. The contrast between young and old, I think, is quite deliberate on the part of Fragonard. And this opulent, just, you know, kind of foliage exploding in all directions, uh, that organic sense, I think, intended to echo the the sensuality of the piece, the young lady kicks off a shoe, uh, again, a kind of a sexual metaphor, while a Cupid figure on the left uh, holds a finger uh, to his lips as if to admonish the two participants in the scandalous little menage a trois to, to you know, keep it on, on the down low, as, as people say today. Um, it's a, a pretty spectacular piece and very effective and, and um, in, in sort of conveying that titillating eroticism typical of the the culture of the French upper classes at the time. It's pallid, again, light greens and sort of frilly pinks and, and what have you really attest to Fragonard's extraordinary skill with oil paint. But that said, the painting and the painter uh, would rapidly find um, itself in disfavor. 1766 is getting on a bit for Rococo. And within a couple of decades, uh, the adherents of uh, this style and uh, the patrons will come up against a much sterner and potentially far uh, more consequential uh, mode of art making, uh, neoclassicism. Um, and, and here we see the, the very famous 1784 painting by Jacques-Louis David, The Oath of the Horatii. And in the ensuing political and social uh, changes that will uh, um, hit France, in the coming decades, uh, painters such as uh, Fragonard rapidly fall, found themselves falling out of favor. Modernize, I think, look at, especially with the postmodern uh, view, with Roco look at Rococo with a little bit more sympathy um, as a kind of expression of, you know, again, a different, less serious art making uh, art making mode.